welcome. We do welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you into this place. Move how you want to move. Do what you want to do. Say what you want to say. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are not ashamed of the precious Holy Spirit. Father, we are not ashamed of you. Father, we thank you for who you are. Lord, you are the great I am. You are the author and finisher of our faith. You are the creator of the heavens and earth and all that in them is. And Father, this morning we love you. We honor you. We praise you. We thank you for your presence that is already in here right now. And Father, we think it's only going to continue to increase, Father God, because we did not come to play church. We did not come to church just because it's Mother's Day. Oh, thank God for this day. Thank God for mothers. But Father, we came to church to draw closer to you. We came to church to hear from you. And Father, we think that's exactly what we're going to do today. Father, I just thank you and praise you for every person that is here. Lord, every person that is under the sound of my voice, I don't know everyone. I have no idea what they're facing or dealing with, but Father, we know that you do. And Lord, I thank you. You're the God of answers. You're the God of solutions. And Lord, thank you today. That's exactly what you're going to do. You're going to answer questions. You're going to speak to the lives, Father God. You're going to help set things back to right in our lives, Father. Things have been all kilter. Things have been going in the wrong direction. You're going to help us get those things back in the right direction. Lord, we give you this service right now. And Satan, we just take authority over you in Jesus' name anyway. We try to enter or stop this the word or anything you try to do, we bind you in Jesus' name and give you no place, power, or authority. Father, we give you complete and total control. Lord, speak through my mouth. Thank you. My tongue shall be as a pen of a ready writer, and their hearts are open and receptive. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And amen. You can be seated. God is good. Thank you so much. Good, wonderful, Jay. Thank you so much. Aren't you excited to see other people getting up here and growing, amen? Yeah, thank you. We're excited. This church is not just about Pastor Jason or even Pastor Jeremy. This church is about everybody, amen? <coughs> what well, part of the vision that needs to keep before us, that the Lord told Pastor Jason, I'm raising, I'm raising up an exceeding great army. That's not three or four people, amen? Raising up an exceeding great army. Are you excited to be here this morning? Yeah. you believe God's going to minister to you? I know I said it earlier, but if anybody trickled in, happy Mother's Day to all our mothers. Aren't you excited to get a hold of the Word of God? Yes, amen. Before I go into that, I want to read. I printed out a little, you know, because you're supposed to do that as a preacher. You're supposed to have some facts or some statistics on Mother's Day. That's, that's what it tells us. But we got a message that's most important. But I did print this out because I thought it was pretty good. Some fun mothering facts. I want to say a few of them. Number of moms in the world right now is 2 billion. 82.5 million mothers in the U.S. First time moms, average, uh, average, average age of new moms is 25 versus 21 in 1970. They were 21 years old in 1970. Number of kids, today's average is two kids. In the 50s, 1950s, I don't know how they did this, but it was three and a half kids. <laughs> I know it's an average, I'm just kidding. In the 1700s, they had seven to 10 kids. So we won't say anything else about that. 4.3 babies are born each second. I got three, and I'm going to tell you, I, I love those with it. all the love I got. I can't have seven. But if you can, God bless you. Working moms. 72% of moms with children over one year old work, about the same as childless women, versus 39% in 1976. 55% of moms with children under one year old work, versus 31% in 1976. Moms with a full-time job spend 13 hours working at the office or at home on family chores. It's a long day. Y'all got quiet when I start talking about that. Y'all right. We'll keep going. Cost of raising a child. Mid Middle-income families spend $242,070 to raise a child to 18, not including college. My Lord. First-year baby. <laughs> I got three kids. <laughs> Don't think about it. We can't dump this kid. They're worth every penny. First year baby cost seven thousand dollars of baby items before first birthday. Thirty pounds as an average weight gain during pregnancy. We will not stop on that one. I'm just I just read it. But what we will say is thank you, moms. <coughs> thank you for sacrificing. Because that's not easy. Amen. I want to read these. I thought these were cute. Uh, the chores, women's average 2.2 hours a day versus 1.3 hours a day for men. Laundry, 88% is done by moms, totaling 330 loads of laundry and 5,300 articles of clothing <coughs> each year. Least favorite chore, vacuuming the stairs. I don't know where that came from. Maybe that is. I'm not a mom. But bathroom multitasking for moms. 
<coughs> Reading is the most common activity, followed by talking on the phone, meditating, watching TV. In the, this is a multitasking bathroom. I don't, maybe you have a TV in your bathroom. Drinking coffee, eating and balancing the checkbook. Diaper changes. That's the last one. I'm gonna, the last little section I'm gonna read. Diaper changes. Seventy-three hundred by baby's second birthday. That's that's wild to think about. Diaper <coughs> changes speed. Mom takes two two minutes five seconds. Adds up to three forty-hour work weeks each year versus dad's one minute thirty-six seconds. Y'all know what that means? Mama's cleaning them better. <laughs> <coughs> Giving attention, this one is so true, and I can. We have a four-year-old, so she, she's uh, the, the preschool before preschool here. It says a preschooler requires mom's attention once every four minutes, or 210 times a day. And I can just hear Hannah, mom, mom, mom. Y'all got a baby? Mom, a young child. I, I, I laugh sometimes. That's what you hear all the time. Mom, if I'm home with her, dad, 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 all the time, need something. Last one, taking care. A preschooler mom spends 2.7 hours a day on primary child care versus 1.2 hours for dads. I just thought those were some funny mothering facts to get you on a lighter note before we jump into the message. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Y'all here this morning? Amen. Again, happy Mother's Day. And we're going to jump right into the Word of God now. As I came out here and started to <coughs> prepare, trying to find a place to put my phone, y'all want me to have my phone up here. And the only reason is because I can't see that clock because of the glare. I mean, I can go right up until 3.30 if I have my phone. So y'all be glad I have my phone. The title, I came out here and began to prayer as I knew Pastor Jason. Him and I talked this week, and they scheduled a surgery, and he said, I'm going to need you to go ahead and be ready. So I started coming out here and praying and seeking God, and because that's how we operate here. If you're visiting this morning, I love you. We're excited you're here. We're thankful you're here. We believe God's going to speak to you even though we don't know you. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. We believe God's going to speak to everybody. In this message today, I don't believe in just preaching a message directly to that mother. I believe it's going to help everybody. Amen. But as I came and began to prepare and seek God, I was right there <coughs> just praying, praying in the Spirit. And, and what I was saying is that this ministry, we don't believe in just this Mother's Day, so the world dictates that we should preach like this certain message. No, we believe in following the Spirit of God. We believe in praying and seeking God because, see, I don't know what you need. I don't know what you're dealing with as a mom. as a And this is even for young girls. That maybe you're not moms yet. This message will help you, too. Maybe you're a grandmother and you're already past raising children. This will help you too. And even a guy, guys, this will help you too. Now, guys, I'll go ahead and tell you, you can't be a mother. Uh, I know that we shouldn't have to say that, but we actually do. You can only be a father. In God's eyes, that's all you can be. Amen? We won't camp out there. I don't want to offend nobody, but the truth is still the truth. But as I was praying and seeking God, like I said, uh, I'm more interested in God. What do you want to say? That's, that's how we were raised and taught. We believe that's the right way. And what the Lord began to deal with me about as I was praying, what I, I kept getting one word, and it was influence. As I was praying, Lord, what do you want me to minister? So our title today is going to be A Mother's Influence. A Mother's Influence. And that's what we're going to talk about for a little while, and it's going to be good because it's going to be what God wants us to have. <coughs> but that's what matters, right? That's what Amen. matters, right? Is this what God wants us to have? Yeah. So we're going to talk about a mother's influence. And I'm going to give you a couple definitions uh, about uh, a, a couple words here before I get started, really, lay the foundation of the word mother. And the, the first definition is a female parent. A female parent. And I did put in parentheses that's not so obvious today. But, again, a mother is the mom. It's the female parent, correct? Yes, amen. A term of address for a female parent or a woman <laughs> having or regarded as having the status, function, or authority of a female parent. Here's a definition I wanted to get to for mother. A woman exercising control, influence, or authority like that of a mother. A woman exercising control, influence, or authority like that of a mother. Now, of course, I have the word influence highlighted, and I wanted to give you a definition of the word influence because our title is The Mother's Influence. I want to talk about a mother's influence this morning. Influence, and you won't be able to write these down probably. You might can hit a few of them, but... The word influence means the capacity or power of persons or things to be a compelling force on or produce effects on the actions, behavior, or opinions of others. Moms, did you know that you're a compelling force on or you produce effects on the actions, behavior, or opinion of others? And those others, of course it can be people out in the world, but the most influence you're going to have is where at? In your home on your children. Number the second definition, the action or process of producing effects on the action, behavior, or opinion of another, which is kind of the same definition. 
I'll skip a few, move down to the other one I like. It said, to move, this is again the word influence, to move or impel a person to some action. To move or impel a person to some action. Our influence, it, it, it affects other people. As a mother, and I, I know I'm a father too, and I won't talk about fathers a lot today, but this applies to everyone. But a mother has so much influence on her family, on her children, on their home. Amen. Do y'all agree with that? A mother has a great influence on her children and how they turn out. Her life choices and her behavior compel her children's choices and their behavior. Her life choices and her behavior. You say, well, my behavior don't affect anybody. I beg to differ. Amen. I beg to differ. Your behavior does, and I can prove it. And I'm the dad, and I can only prove it. I'm going to use a uh, You probably heard me tell this before, but I've always taken my kids to school every morning. That's just something that I enjoy doing, and I was always getting out and going anyway. So I'll never forget Nate, which is my yeah, – he's about there at the camera. He's, he's 14 now, but he was young. And I, I, y'all know me. I don't really – if you don't know me, I, I'm not a huge fan of traffic. So Marion is right, right up my alley. We, uh, you can ride around town anytime you want to. You can go Friday night afternoon. You don't have to worry about traffic jams. So – um, but from from where we're from, Charleston, there was some traffic. But where Sarah was from, Atlanta, I, I, sometimes it could be called Hades. But anyway, uh, not Haiti, but Hades. Which, yeah. but anyway, so me, we're driving to school one morning, and uh, my son, I can take take you back to where we were sitting, or where we were turning the red light, and we were probably running closer on time than we needed to be. Um, but I, my little boy is sitting over in the seat, going, "We got behind some traffic, and people just, you know, how people drive? They were just poking along. They're probably on their phone." They probably pulled out in front of me and was getting ready to turn. You know how people do it. <laughs> so anyway, they were doing that, and I wasn't saying nothing. But my son said, oh, my goodness, what is going on? And I'm talking about as a little boy. <laughs> he was young, probably five, six years old. What are you doing? Get out of the way. That's, and I'm like, I, I just immediately was like, oh, my gosh. What, what, what happened? He was influenced by somebody. And I would like to tell you it was his mother, but it wasn't. <laughs> And what? Because my wife don't care how slow you go. She's going to compete with you. <coughs> I'm just kidding. But my wife's not in a rush and driving something. But the point I'm making is we as parents have tremendous influence on our children. Trem our behavior. Man, he would have never known it if I was patient. He'd have never known to do that. But he, he knew to do that because he had watched that. You know, I don't do credit. I don't wave out with one finger or nothing like that. We don't believe in doing that. But sometimes I just don't like traffic. Amen? Y'all know if there's four lanes... There's a fast lane and a slow lane, right? Mm -hmm. There's not a right and a left. We won't preach on traffic this morning, but I just want to make sure you knew that. <laughs> Amen. Just, it's okay laughing in church. Y'all know that, right? Mm -hmm. So our influence, and we'll talk about a mother. A mother has great influence on her children and how they turn out. Her life choices and behavior compel her children's choices and behavior. There's, and, and listen, there's either a good influence or bad influence. There's only two. I know in the world today we like to think, well, I can do what I want and all this stuff. And you can, but what we have to still understand is no matter what's going on out there, your, your, your actions have consequences. Yes, they do. Your actions have, as a parent, and, and I know I'm talking to mothers, but fathers, this applies to you too. Our actions have consequences. If we have little children, you know the song, be careful, you know, because the little eyes, are, they're watching you. Those little children are always watching you. But there's good influence. I'm going to look at a scriptural example. Flip over in your Bible to John chapter 2. There's good influence, and we'll look at some bad influence, and then we'll get into the, the heat of the message. It's going to be good. You believe that? Yes. I believe God's going to speak to us this morning. Oh, yeah. I believe God's going to minister to us right where we're at and going to help us. Because you know that's what coming to church is all about. The Word of God is a transforming agent in our life. The Word of God is how we're supposed to guide our lives. Not by the world system, but by what God said. Amen? John chapter 2, y'all know this story, but I'm going to read probably a couple of verses here, probably actually down to verse 10. This is when Jesus, you know, Jesus had a mother. What was her name? Mary. Mary. Y'all know Jesus had to be submitted unto his mother just like he told us to be. Y'all know that, right? Because Jesus on this earth was a man anointed by the Holy Spirit just like we are. He stripped himself of deity and he came to earth to substitute for us. If he, if he came as Jesus with all the power and authority... That, that Jesus had in heaven, then he wouldn't have been a, a proper substitute for us. He had to come just like us. Now, he did come through a virgin. We understand that because he don't have the seed, you know, of the fall of nature. He doesn't have that. But what I'm saying is he was a man, a man anointed by the Holy Ghost and he had a mother. So let's start in verse 1, John chapter 2, verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. We know that was Mary. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. So Jesus was told he was going to the marriage. Y'all see that? And verse 3, And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, talking about Jesus, 
they have no wine. So they ran out of wine. Mary looked at Jesus and said, they have no wine. And this is Jesus' response. Jesus said unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? My <coughs> hour is not yet come. So in other words, I believe Jesus was saying, hey, my hour is not yet come. It's not time for me to do anything. But I want you all to see his mother's response. His mother turns around and looks at the disciples in verse 5 and said, his mother said unto the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Y'all see that? Is that not funny to anybody else? The mother said, he, the mother said, hey, they're out of wine. Jesus said, woman, what am I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. In other words, it's not, it's not time for me to be, to be, it's not time yet. His mom turns around and looks at the servant and said, whatever he tells you to do, go do it. So she knew he's going to listen to me. He's going to do whatever I tell him to do and listen to what he did. It says in verse 6, and there were there six, six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three fur kids apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. Y'all know what they filled them up with? What they filled them up with? And verse 8, And he said to them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then, the, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. His mother had a good influence on him. Guess what this was? This is actually the first miracle Jesus did in the Bible. Y'all know that? He turned the water into wine. I believe that was because of his mother's influence. His mother helped kick off his earthly ministry. Amen. Don't you think that's a good influence? Whatever he tells you to do, do it now. Go to 2 Timothy real quick. 2 Timothy. Mary was a good influence on Jesus. We know that. But I want to point out something else over here about Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to get to the message, and this is a message, but I'm going to get some other stuff in just a minute, but I, I want to lay this foundation. Is that okay with y'all? <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 1. I'm going to read 1 through 5. So we see Mary is a good influence on Jesus, and she was. She was a great mother. Y'all, if you remember the whole story, if you go all the way through the Gospels, she was right there the whole time watching as he was crucified. She was one that was going to the tomb. They were going to clean him up. She was a good mother. She sat, and, and you know, and when I think of a good mother... Well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. So let me, let's, let's do this. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. I'm going to get to verse 5 where I want to get, but verse 4 says, Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Listen to verse 5. We'll pull something out of here. It says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. I'm going to talk to mothers and grandmothers right there, and I want you to see what Paul's saying. He's telling Timothy, I see the faith you have. I see it in you, but guess where he saw it first? He said, I saw it first in your mother, and then I, saw, I also saw it before that in your grandmother. Let me explain something to you. You affect the next generation. Amen. Your decisions and your behavior compels the next generation and their decisions and their behavior. Eunice here, the, the grandmother, and, and uh, Lois and Eunice, they were important in Timothy's life. I personally believe, and I, I know I can't prove this, Timothy would have never been who he was without his mother and his grandmother's influence. Paul acknowledged the faith that he had came down through his family. And while I was on that, I want to point out my grandmother who sits here today. And, and I've got it wrote down right here in my notes because I remember going to Papa and Gurney's house when we were little boys. And Wesley's sitting here and he'll remember this. And James is in class and Pastor Jason's at home. But we could all vouch for it. In the summertime, we go to, to Granny and Papa's house and we always wanted to you know, come here on the farm. We had all kinds of fun here as young children. But I remember us, we'd get up early in the morning, because that's one thing I didn't understand. <laughs> it was summertime. We'd both be sleeping. But anyway, I, I can hear Granny today as good as I can. And it's been 25. It's actually been longer. That's been 30 years ago. I can hear her saying, rise and shine. Rise and shine. How you want your eggs? No. <laughs> As the granny was up, she was cooking. Papa had already actually been gone. They get up early and they were gone. But we get up, we'd eat breakfast. We'd do what, what Papa would say, wash your face. Wash your hands, wash your face, brush your teeth. That's what, and so that's what we did. But I'll never forget this. I'm getting to a point of the influence somebody has on you because I can hear it today. And I'll be 38 years old this year. We've done everything. 
And then, of course, us boys was headed outside because we had three wheelers and dune buggies and fours and had a bunch of land down there and all kinds of animals. And so we was gone. We didn't, <coughs> and, you know, you didn't sit around Papa and Granny's house and watch TV and play video games anyway. Uh, but anyway, we were outside. We won't get off on that. But I remember once we got outside, we were playing. We come back inside. I remember coming back outside for anything. Let's say I needed Granny for something. And we go into the other house. Like I said, we'll be there today. And I can, I can hear it like yesterday. We come inside, like, Granny, Granny, and we didn't get no answer. But I remember going to that bedroom door, and I remember hearing that woman right there crying out to her Jesus, praying and praying and praying, praying for her family, praying for her community, praying for her friends, calling out to God. <clears throat> that influenced us. That influenced <coughs> us. And like I said, I can hear it today. It impacted us. And so I thank you for being that person. I thank you for, for being that example and influence to us, Granny. But I, that I, I, as I read about this and I saw how she affected these people, the mother and grandmother affected Timothy, I thought, yes, that it worked in our life. When a grandmother or a mother, and I'm talking to grand, maybe you're here your grandma, your past raising children, you still have an effect on your grandchildren or great grandchildren. They need to see you seeking God. They need to see you making good, godly choices and decisions. They need to hear us pray. They need to know that we have a Bible. Amen. 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 And so I remember that. And I remember that good influence in our life. And like I said, I can hear it today as good as I can hear anything. I can hear her in there. We stand there for a little while out of curiosity just to listen to her pray. We didn't interrupt her. We just listened to her pray. And I remember now, of course, and I'm talking about mothers, but I remember standing at my dad's door. It's also hearing him pray. It's very similar. But guess what? It was affected generations. And here we are today praying and seeking God. But flip over in your Bibles in Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. We're going to get to the meat of the message, but we, we're going to lay this foundation. There's good influence and there's bad influence. I want to read a quick story about some bad influence. You know, parents and, and mothers and fathers, I'm, I'm speaking to everybody. Did you know that you're called to be a parent, not a friend? Mm -hmm. I know in today's world is so big stuff. Mamas and daddies want to be the children's best friend. And listen, being their best friend will come with time, but it don't start that way. You're first a parent. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I was thinking I wasn't going to get a lot of shout and excitement this morning, but we're going to deliver the message God gave us. That's all we can do, right? Amen. It's going to be good, but it, and if it gives us the thinking, that's fine, but I, I just want to encourage you. The friendship will come. My dad, before he passed away, was my best friend in the world. I talked to my dad about everything. We were very, very close, but up coming through you know, my childhood, he didn't feel like a friend sometimes when he would tear my butt up. <laughs> and, and, hey, this doesn't feel like a very good friendship when you're thanking me. I didn't ever tell him that, but why? Because he was a he was a daddy first, you know. Mama, she tried to spank us. Us boys, we got pretty big, and so I'll, I'll never forget the time. This will get you laughing. I need you to laugh. Laugh is good, good like a medicine. Amen. So I remember one time, Mom. I'll never forget this. Uh, I had done something. Dad was working at Ernie's Auto Parts and pastor, but he wasn't home. So I had done something. It was probably my mouth. You don't know me. I'm, I'm, I'm different now, but I used to be extremely sarcastic, and, and I'm a very quick-witted person, which I know people say, oh, that's great. No, it's not. It cost me a lot of spanking. Uh, but anyway, it cost me. It did cost me. I'll never forget Mom saying, come in here. I'm going to spank you, and she, she started spanking me, and you know, like I said, I was probably, honestly, probably close to high school, and she said, well, how'd you like that? And I said, that was fine. How about some more? <laughs> that's exactly what I said to her. I, I really did. I said, that was fine. Mom, I like some more. And she said, no, I'm going to call your daddy. I said, no, no. <laughs> everything, everything at that moment changed. Because, listen, when dad got done, you never asked for no more. Never. That, that, that thought process wasn't in your mind. You were just thinking, am I going to make it? Am I going to make it? Uh, dad could never abuse us. Uh, Duplic, you can't get him anyway. He's in heaven. But uh, he never abused us at all. My dad was a wonderful father. So don't think, I, if you don't know me and know that I joke a lot, that I'm just, he corrected us. And we believe in correction. Amen. Amen. But Mark chapter 6, we're going to talk real quickly about some bad influence. Look at verse number 18. I won't read the whole thing. I just want to read a few scriptures. It says, For John said, had said to Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. So he told him, It's not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Well, the wife didn't like that. 19 says, Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and a holy, and observed him. And when he, had, when he heard him, he did many things, and heard him gladly. And when a convenient, verse 21, and when a convenient day was come, that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee, 
Verse 22, and when the daughter of the, of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod, and then that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, the girl that was dancing, the woman's daughter, Ask of me whatever thou will, and I will give it to thee. Y'all know that's a dangerous, dangerous statement, right? And verse 23, and he swear unto her, Whatever thou ask of me, I will give it to thee under half of my kingdom. That girl must have been dancing for him to want to give away half his kingdom. Verse 24, and she went forth and said unto her mother, listen to what the mother, she went to her mom. She was given an opportunity, whatever you ask of the half of my kingdom, I'll give it to you. So she runs to her mom, and her mom has an agenda. Her mom's behavior is getting her to affect this young girl. And she went forth and said to her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. See, this mama wanted something real bad that wasn't right. Now, John the Baptist, y'all know who John the Baptist was, right? Y'all know this wasn't a godly thing, that she was going to take his head. This was not a godly thing. Verse 25, and she came in, the girl came in straightway, which means immediately with haste into the king, and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by, by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceedingly sorry, yet for his oath's sake, and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in the prison, and brought his head into a, in a charger and gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. Now don't tell me you don't have a, a powerful influence on your child. Now that's a bad influence, don't you think? <laughs> but we don't want to have that kind of influence. We don't want to be that mother that, that encourages us our children to go down the wrong path. So I want to get into the meat of what we want to talk about tonight or this morning. I want to talk for a while about how we are to use our influence in our, our children's lives. Y'all know this as good as I do, but the world confuses it. But I need you to know there's only two paths in life. In this life, there's only two paths. There's only two. There's only two places, two plans you can take. That's God's plan for your life or the enemy's plan for your life. I know a lot of people think, well, I can just do what I want to do. No, you can't. You can, but you can't. Amen. You can, but you can't. Because there's a reason, I'm not going to get ahead of myself, there's a reason you were put on this earth. There are only two paths in this life that your kids can take. They can either take God's chosen path for their lives, or they can take the enemy's path for their lives. And I can prove that in Psalm 30, just write this one down, we won't go there. But in Psalms 37, 23, the Bible says the steps of the good man are ordered by the Lord. The steps of the good man are ordered by the Lord. Write down Jeremiah 1, 5. This is when the Lord was talking to Jeremiah, and this is what he said to him. I always use this, and I will always use it. He said, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. And before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you and ordained you a prophet to the nations. Now, that tells me that God, number one, it tells me that God formed Jeremiah. And if God formed Jeremiah, guess who else he formed? You and I. <coughs> but it also tells me that he said to Jeremiah, before you came forth... I had ordained you a prophet to the nations. And you're not, I'm not saying we're all prophets at all, but I am going to say this. We all have a plan before we come forth out of the womb. God has a specific plan for you to be on planet Earth. God has a specific plan. When we come to Earth and we just take up this Earth as our home, number one, that tells me we haven't read the Bible because if you're a believer, Earth is not your home. Amen. Heaven is your home. Amen. We are ambassadors here. But we are not to camp out and be just like the world. We're in the world to make the world different, to be different. Amen. The Bible yeah, calls amen. us as believers hinderers of lawlessness. I'm here to tell you, if all the believers left the earth today, this thing would absolutely implode. Mm -hmm. It would absolutely implode. Yes, but the, I want to talk for a minute again. If, and, and the word says in Acts 10, 34, that God is no respecter of persons. That Another translation says God plays no favor. So when I hear God tell Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you came forth, I sanctified you and ordained you a prophet to the nations. And then he says, I play no favors. God didn't love Jeremiah any more than he loved you or me. So your mom and dad played a part in it, but God formed you. Amen. God formed you. Thank you. And before you were birthed out, now you might have been told your whole life, and I hope you have. But I know people are telling their kids all the time you were an accident. We didn't mean to have you. I need you to know something. That's a lie. Now your parents might not have meant to have you. It might have accidentally happened. But you are not an accident. Amen. You are not an accident. I promise you, our God didn't say, oh, what are we going to do now? <laughs> That's not what happened. God sent you on earth. God sent you here for a reason. Amen. God sent you for a reason. You are not an accident. Don't ever believe that. That's a lie. That's why <coughs> I know a lot of parents will say that, and, and I'd like to get into a room with them. But either way, we won't do that. John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes not, but for to do what? 
Still kill and destroy. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life or have it more abundantly. So I'm just pointing out a fact here before we jump into the message or, or the meat of it. That there are only two paths in life. I, like I said, there's God's way or it's, I, I, would, I would say the enemy's way. And, and so really, when man just makes a choice or a woman makes a choice, I'm going to do what I want to do. 99% of the time, you're not following God. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Okay. Because I'm here to tell you there's some sacrifice that comes along with following God. And write this one down too. Deuteronomy chapter 30, 19 and 20 tells us that there's only two, life, two paths. The Lord said, I set before you today life and death, <coughs> blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. So there's life or there's death, right? Life would be God's path. Death would be the enemy's path. Amen. Amen. And he, the, the enemy, I know a lot of churches don't preach that, but y'all know the devil's real, right? Y'all know the devil's real, right? We're not here to magnify him and lift him up. We acknowledge he's real. We acknowledge he's the God of this world because the word says that. We also acknowledge he's a defeated foe. Yes. We also acknowledge in, in Colossians 2.15, Jesus Christ's full principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly. Amen? So we acknowledge he's defeated, but we acknowledge he's here. And the word says in 1 Peter 5.8, he's walking around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Right? Yes, amen. Now you can say, well, he's not going to devour me. That's a good first step. And the way he don't devour you is by you living in line with the word. Amen. My question today to all mothers, and, and we can apply it to fathers too, but, but I'm going to talk to mothers today. My question today to all mothers is which path are you influencing your kids to choose? You are influencing them one way or the other, but you are influencing them. Are you influencing them to follow God and his path? Or are you influencing them to follow the world's pattern and plan? These are just some questions to think about. Which way are you, because remember, the word influence means to compel in a certain direction, to compel their behavior, their choices. And, and the question that I'm asking, I, I know you could apply it to everyone in here, and to be honest with you, you should, because I'm not just preaching to mothers. But it definitely applies to mothers, because a lot of times, mothers are with the children more than anybody. Most of the time, yeah. But the question is, and I know it's going to get quiet, but that's fine. I'm still going to deliver the message God gave me. Is that okay with you? Amen. If it ain't, you just put your head down and we'll, we'll leave after I won't be long. But we're going to deliver the message. And I'm here to tell you, if you'll listen, it'll help you. Yes, if you'll listen, it'll help you. say, I'm done raising children. This message will still help you. This message will still help you. So the question I had, again, are we, are we influencing them to follow the world's pattern or God's plan? Are you pointing them in the right direction? Psalms, write this one down because i got some other scriptures we've got to get to. Psalms 127 verse 4 tells us our children are arrows in the hand of a mighty warrior. And so if you think about someone with a bow and arrow, you've got to aim somewhere, right? And so my question with that is, are you pointing them <coughs> in the right direction? Are you teaching your kids? And I'm going to say some things this morning that maybe cause you to think that's fine. I, I love people, but I'm going to deliver exactly what God wants me to deliver. I, I ask you this question. Are you teaching your kids, hey, you can do anything you want to do? And I know that's real popular. I know that because I hear it all the time. I tell my kids they can do anything they want to do. Well, that, I believe your kids can do anything they want to do. But as a parent, I'm going to tell you what I tell my kids. And I'm not the greatest parent in the world. I'll be the first to tell you that. But I tell my kids, you know what? I believe you can do anything you want to do, but I don't believe you should. I believe you need to find out what God wants you to do. And that's what you need to do. <coughs> you, can, you say, well, I want my kids to have better than me. Well, who's determining what's better? Is that you or is that me? Or is it God? Because to have better than someone just means to me they follow God a little bit closer. It doesn't mean that they have more money. See, that's what we get caught up so much. We get caught up trying to be like the world. Well, I just want my kids to have more money than me. I, I, like I said, I'm going to say some things. Maybe you have this desire for your kids to be a doctor because you want your kids to make a bunch of money. But let me ask you a question. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you wanting your kids to be blessed. But what if God called your kid to be a missionary to a country that don't even have running water? What if there's a faction of people on planet Earth that might not be reached until your child obeys God? And you're telling them, hey, you can go be a doctor because you can go make a bunch of money. Go be a lawyer, you can go make a bunch, of, a bunch of money. But God's saying, I called them somewhere. Before they were formed, I knew them. I equipped them. I, I gave them some anointing. I gave them what they needed. And I called them to this nation. And we're telling them, hey, go, don't live like me. Don't, you need to have more than me. Well, my question is, what's more and what's better? That's my question this morning. What's more and what's better? Is, is what's more and what's better what the world says is more and better? Or what God says is more and better? That's my question. It's really, my question is, who determines what's best? Is it us? And I know as parents, we, we, we want what's best for our kids. I understand that. 
But some, and I don't want to get ahead of myself here, we've got to be willing to offer our children to God. No matter what he has them to do. I sat in the hospital this week again. I'll use a girl named Papa. And Papa and I talked about, we were talking about Daddy. My dad, if you don't know who I'm talking about. Um, who's with the Lord today. And we, we miss him, but we know where he's at. We'll see him again. We don't sorrow like others sorrow. Amen. We were sitting there talking about when my dad left to back in the, in the, it must have been 80, 79, it was, it was 80, 79 or 80. We left, I say that, Pastor Danny, which was my dad, my mom, Miss Ginger, and Jason and myself, James was not born yet. We left here to move to Oklahoma. And Pop was just telling me, Papa said, you don't understand. I hurt as bad when he left. When that U-Haul truck drove off from Marion, I hurt as bad almost as I did when he passed away. Didn't you say that to me? And I thought to my, this morning, I was sitting on the front row thinking about that, and I believe it was the Lord. And I'm so thankful today. See, Pop had a business. They went over Charles. They, they was, and Dad, they was going to work together their whole life. That was their plan. That was their plan. That, and that's an awesome plan to have. But the question is, what if God changes your plan? Are you willing to offer your child to God and say, Lord, you know best. Take them and use them. And I know that. And the point I want to make with what I'm saying right now is so many people tell you today, and they preach it in churches, the plan of God's so easy. They're not following the plan of God. Because that's not always easy. But I remember, you know, I remember him telling me about it. Obviously, I was only one, so I do not remember. But I was present. Uh, I remember him. I remember going to Oklahoma and, then, you know, being gone for two years. And we came back here for just a little while. And they moved to Monk's Corner, which is about an hour and 45 minutes away. But I thought about that this morning. I thought. That wasn't easy. That wasn't easy to say goodbye. But they, they were not, not that they could stop him, but they encouraged him. And it hurt. But follow God. <clears throat> follow God. Do what God tells you to do. And I believe a lot of it goes back to the influence that they had on him. And I think about what I just told you earlier about Granny. I think that's a lot of the reason that my dad was able to leave and go do what he was called to do. Is because there was a, a faith before him that laid that path and said, hey, Whatever you want my son to do, whatever you want my children to do, Uncle Charles is doing what God's called him to do at this present time. Dad was doing what God called him to do at that present time, but they were willing to offer their children, and that wasn't easy. But that's what we're called to do. Amen. We're going to get into some meat of this here in just a second. But I want to, like I said, I'm just asking the question, what's best for them? What's best for our children? Because like I said, I tell my children, I ride down the road, and we talk about it because I know... I know what the world says. The world says go to school, make great grades. Nowadays, you have to go to a four-year college. Then you have to probably go to more school before you can ever do anything. And my question is always, is that what God's telling you, or is that what the world's telling you? Because I'm going to go ahead and say some things. Did I already go ahead and say some things? I am not against education. Do not, do not sit here and leave this morning saying, oh, that preacher's against education. I've been going to further education and ministry for, uh, uh, this is my eighth year. I have a master's degree in theology. I believe in, in ministry. I believe, uh, I believe in education. But I, I want to talk about how the enemy has infiltrated our education system, in case you don't know that. And I, I, wanna, I like to expose things. I like to point it out. I, saw, I was thinking about it this morning as I was praying and getting ready. The devil works. You see nowadays, he starts working on them in kindergarten all the way up through high school. He's plant, guess what he's doing in grade school? This is what I would, I would say. The enemy is planting seeds. But see, what happens, he's smart. He, he's been doing this a long time. When I say he, I'm talking about the enemy. He's been doing this a long time. He's planting seeds of doubt and confusion and liberalism and all kinds of things in our children. But he knows that every day they go home. See, if a parent's paying attention, if my kid has home, come home from school and I ask them, what you learn? What's going on? What's happening? What, you know, I want to hear what's going on. If you heard something, if you're a believer and you heard something, you would correct that, wouldn't you? He said, hold on just a minute. Let me see what you do. Let me see what's going on in your school. You ought to as a good parent. What's going on? You, you want to see that. Why? And the enemy knows that. So you can thwart the plan of the enemy. You can say, hold on just a minute. We don't believe that. Listen, they get to teach an evolution in school. I'm going to tell you, that's what I'm <coughs> You know, I always have a question for evolutionists. If we came from a monkey, at what point did monkeys stop turning into humans? We still have monkeys, right? And I've never seen one yet evolve into a human. And we won't get onto that subject, but I'm just saying, at what point did they stop? I mean, did it, one day they just thought, okay, there's enough humans they can reproduce. Either way, I'm going to tell you how we got here. We got here because God put us here. We got here because God created us, and I'm making a point. Because in the school system, they're working on it. 
But then what happens, like I said, mom and dad at home can correct things that are wrong. Then you've got the whole summertime with them. And they come, if you're doing like you ought to be doing, they're going to church. They're learning about the Lord. They're learning the Word. So you're able to combat that thing. But then guess what happens? The world says, oh, no, listen, you can't stop after 12th grade. You've got to go to college. Now, I'm not against colleges, but please listen. Hear me out for just a minute. If the, and I believe with all my heart, I'll go ahead and say this to preface what I'm about to say. I believe there's a lot of people, Lord, that you have to go to college to do what God's called you to do. Because everybody's not called to be a preacher behind the pulpit. There are people who are called to be doctors. There are people who are called to be lawyers. No, you're not called to be a doctor and a lawyer like every other doctor and lawyer. Now, you're going to have to go through the schooling, but you're called to be different. If you're called by God to be a doctor, you're called to be different than every other doctor. Now, you've got to do some of the same procedures, but you ought to be anointed to do what you do. You're equipped if God calls you to do it. Amen. But what happens is, a lot of times everybody says, well, now you got to go to, you got to, go to a four-year school no matter what. No matter what, you just got to go to a four-year school. And I'm going to tell you what I call, and I hope nobody gets mad, but if you do, I'm just going to say it anyway. But I, for, I, I'm not going to hold any offense against you. I call a lot of liberal colleges, and I'm not saying all of them, but liberal colleges <coughs> are indoctrination stations. Yes, what, what, let me tell you something. This is what happens. Tell, tell, remember what I just said? The enemy's planting seeds through grade school. But guess what he does in college? He reaps that harvest because guess what happens now? They're not coming home every day. Mm -hmm. Then professors can teach them whatever they want. And for in, in the beginning of I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Give them a little bit of time. Give them a little bit of time. Not going home to hear mom and dad. Not going home to get fed at their local church. Most of them get off to college. They ain't going to church nowhere. They're just going to fall in the pattern of what their friends are doing. And they're going to get indoctrinated with some stuff that you don't believe in. They were never taught. So the most important thing, I'm not getting into all that. I, I believe in colleges. I do. I believe them. But I only believe this. You need to go to college. And when God tells you to go, where God tells you to go, you say, that's crazy. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Your steps are ordered by God. That means when you get done with high school, actually before you get done, as, if, as a high schooler, some of you high schoolers in here, you need to be saying to God now, what's my next step? What's my next step? Is it a four-year school? Is it a technical school? Am I supposed to start a business? Am I, what am I supposed to do? Is it a theological school? What have you called me to do? That's what you need to be saying. And as parents, we ought to be influencing them in, in that direction. Amen. You all agree with that? The greatest thing you will ever do in this life as a mother is to teach your, teach your children to obey God. There was only two amens for that. I'm here to tell you, the only thing, the best thing you'll ever do is to teach your children to obey God at all costs. Yes. At all costs. And you say, oh, <coughs> listen, and, and this, is, this is sad that we even have to talk about this. But a lot of people say, well, what are my friends going to think if my kid don't go to college? My question is, who gives a rip what your friends think? I'm, I'm being honest. Who cares? What Are you trying to keep up with your friends or are you trying to teach your children to obey God? Come on now. I mean, the truth yeah. is, are, are we going to teach our kids to go, I'm sitting here talking to you about my grandmother and my father, and I'm telling you and showing you by a literal fact that when you obey God, it affects generations. Don't you want to affect generations after you in a good way? Don't you want to leave them with a legacy of faith and obedience to God? Isn't that the greatest thing we'll ever do? Who cares what your friends and neighbors think about your kid going to school? Who cares? Now, if God tells them to go to school, he'll provide for them, and they won't have to get out there with $200,000 debt when they're 21 years old. Mm -hmm. If God tells them to go, he'll take care of it. This whole thing's set up to make them fail. Come on. It's <laughs> set up to make them fail. But when you get hold of God and obey him, you don't fail. Isaiah 119 says, if you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. What we as parents, and I'm talking to mothers too, mainly because you're with them all the time, the greatest thing you'll ever do. Maybe you've been teaching the wrong things and you're, the Lord's dealing with you this morning. I'm telling you, it's okay to go to your kids and say, listen, I was wrong. I don't know how many times I've done that. I was wrong, but I want you to know the greatest thing I'll ever teach you is to obey God. You seek God's face. I'll pray with you. We're going to find out why God put you on earth. Mark Twain said the two greatest days on planet earth are number one, the day you're born. Number two, the day you find out why you were born. Amen. That's a great, why were you born? You should ask yourself, and when I have my little children, and this is the truth, <coughs> life, and I only did it because I heard Brother Hagen do it. The Dr. Kenneth Hagen that we follow behind, I'll never forget when I had Nate and Cameron. I took them in my arms and handed them to <coughs> And I said, Lord, I thank you for these gifts. I thank you for these babies. I pray over them. And I want great things for my kids just like you do. But the greatest thing for my kids is that they obey God. And I remember saying, Lord, I give you my children. I give you my children. I will let them obey you. I will let them go anywhere. I will not influence them in the wrong way. I will influence them in the right way. I will teach them to follow you and obey you, and I've endeavored to do that. Have I failed? Yes, we've all failed, so I'm not knocking nobody. 
But I've, I've got back up, repented, asked God to forgive me, and I pushed my kids. You follow God. Don't follow this world. What are we thinking, teaching our kids to follow the pattern of the world? We're supposed to teach them to follow this pattern. Amen. Amen. This is the pattern right here we're supposed to teach them to follow. I've got to move on. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. I know y'all are so excited this morning. You are. You're getting something, aren't you? Yeah, I pray you are, and I, I pray with all my heart you are. I got to deliver this message anyway. I want to read a couple of stories to you out of the Word of God that I thought were really good, and I will not be able to read the whole thing, so I have to summarize it. If you'll just write down First Samuel chapter one, it's the whole chapter. Anybody ever heard of Hannah? In the Word of God, we see Hannah here. I'll just read a couple of chapters or verses to get started. It says, now, verse 1, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramath, Ramathan Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, and Eph, Ephrathite. I'm glad names have evolved. <laughs> we had a part time if it wasn't. And he had two wives. I'm glad that changed too. The name of the one was Hannah. The name of the other was Penaniah. And, Pen and I hope I'm saying that right, but either way, Penaniah had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of the city yearly to worship at the sacrifice of the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penaniah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore. Y'all see this, right? For to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, her Hannah, Why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? She didn't answer, so I guess the answer was no, because she kept crying out for children. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk, now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by the post of the temple of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow, listen to this vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto thee, Lord, all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass as he continued praying for the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Though, well, I'll, I'll start summarizing here. Eli thought she was drunk because she was in such distress. She was crying. The Bible says her mouth, uh, or her, she was praying, but she wasn't speaking. Her mouth was moving, but she was over there in <coughs> distress. And, and so he thought she was drunk and told her she shouldn't be drunk. He said, no. she said, I'm not drunk. And she explained to him her situation. And he blessed her. And listen over, we'll skip on down. Let's go on to verse 20. Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord, and the man Elkanah, the husband, and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide forever. Y'all see that? And there abide forever. <coughs> And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good. Tarry until thou hast weaned him. Only the Lord established his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him into the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh, my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I pray, the Lord hath given me my petitions, which I asked of him. Listen to verse 28. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Y'all see what Hannah did. She lent her child to the Lord. And I had a question. Will you lend your children to God? Mothers, will you lend your children to God? Will you lend them to God? What I mean by that is, will you let them do what God wants them to do? Or are we always pushing them to do what the world says we should do? Because the world has a plan. The world, and remember, we said there's only two patterns. And I'm not saying, I will say this. Lots of young people are following that pattern. And they're getting 
they're getting to the end of that pattern. And I know people right now that have great education and can't get a job. Yeah. And they got all kinds of debt. And you know what that would lead to? It would lead to great frustration for me. If I was told this is the path you should take. And I go spend all these years in school. Not anymore. All these years in school. And, and I got all this debt. And I get out there and I can't, can't make what I think I should make. And I've got, now I want to start a family. But Lord, I got $200,000 in debt without buying a house, a car, or anything. But I got to try and pay back. I know everybody don't have $200,000, but there's a lot of them that do. $100,000, $200,000 trying to pay it back. If I got to that place and fall, and I couldn't, things weren't working out, I think I'd be a very frustrated person. And I'd be, well, I'd be saying, Lord, what's wrong? What's going on? And what I'm saying is a lot of people get into that path and realize this ain't what I was supposed to be doing. This ain't what I was supposed to be doing. Now, that would be a bad place. Now, can you change? Absolutely. But that debt's still going to be there. Mm -hmm. Amen. And it's still going to be there. And I'm not preaching about debt this morning, but what I'm saying is why not now? Especially if you're in here this morning, you have young children and young ladies that do not have children, but plan to in the future. Please take heed to this message. When you do have children, why not point them, take that arrow that that child is and point it in the direction that God has told you to point. God will lead you and guide you. I remember Nate, my son, when he was young. See, I'm a, uh, as I, if you know me down from here, me and Pastor Jason, our kids all tell us we're very much alike. We like to grow up and have fun. We pick on our kids. Jay takes a lot of the blunt. Jay, the boys do. Because we don't pick on the girls as much. But, <coughs> so the boys, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing for y'all. But anyway, it'll make you tough. But we pick on our kids. And, but I remember when Nate was very young. Nate always, and even today, has a very, very, very tender heart. All, I always had, he's, we always say Nate's got a heart as big as a room. If you know Nate, Nate, and I know he probably won't want to say that, but Nate's got a big old heart. He loves everybody. He will help anybody. He's a, he doesn't need a stranger. I mean, he just, I remember as a young, as a young dad, I remember cutting up with Nate, picking on Nate, and, and I was going to make him, you know, make him tough. You know what dads do. I, I didn't want him to be sweet. And I want to be careful when I say that. I didn't want him to be sweet in the wrong way. <coughs> Amen. <coughs> I didn't want to be sweet in the wrong way, but I remember as plain as I've ever heard anything, the Lord said, ah, oh, don't do that to him. I got a plan for him. I got a plan for him. Don't do that to him. I, I gave him that heart. I want him to be soft like that. And so I had to make some adjustments. And I said, Lord, what was I doing? I'm working with God. These children are a gift from God. And what we're doing, we're entrusting these children to work with God, to bring God's plan with past, not mom and dad's. Amen. That, that's really where we're at is our children are, and we'll get to that in just a second. I'm not going to keep you long, but the, our children are a gift from God. Just like we preach about money. You know, the Lord entrusts us with money, but he expects us to handle it the way he said. He entrusts us with children, which is way greater than any money you could ever have. But he expects us to train and raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He expects us to point them in a direction he wants them to go, not the way we want them to go. And the problem we run into is we all want better for our children. But I go back to the question is, who determines better? Who determines better? Because I promise you this. I believe this, and I can vouch for it. I used to preach to youth, and I remember hearing some of the stories. There was a, uh, y'all remember the, you, some of you might not remember, but there was a band, a band, Urbana, and there was a lead singer of it who was a millionaire, a multi-millionaire, and he took his life. And I thought to myself, well, wait a second. He's got everything everybody says you should have, fame, fortune, wife, child, he had everything, but he took his life while he was miserable. So we, we've got to be careful buying the lie that if I just had more, if my kids just had more, they'll be happy. I want to tell you the greatest happiness you'll ever have is laying your head on your pillow at night knowing I'm walking with God. Amen. Knowing I'm right in the middle of God's will. I'm doing what God's called me to do. I'm where God told me to be. That's the greatest thing you'll ever have. That's what's better. That's what's best. It's when your children are pointed in the direction of God. But I want to ask you, like, like Hannah here, are you willing? See, Hannah struggled for decades to have a child. She was mocked, ridiculed, and made fun of. So when she finally had a child, she recognized this is a gift from God. And I made a vow to him. If I had a man child, I'd give it back to him. And I'm going to lend this child to the Lord. Now, don't tell me that was easy to leave your young child there because that wasn't easy. Now, you ought not to be leaving your young children nowhere. It's not like it was back then. What I'm saying is you ought to offer them to God and say, God, whatever you call them to do, I will help them. I will push them. I will develop them. I'll give them every <coughs> opportunity in the world to be what you call them to be, not what I call them to be. Because we all have great desires for our children. But he has the greatest desire. And as a parent, to be honest with you, the greatest desire you should have is that your child fulfills the plan of God. Yeah. That should be the greatest desire, that they fulfill the plan of God. 
Because I'm here to tell you, and I, I know everybody here don't know me, but the truth of the matter is this. Every person will stand before Almighty God. And I don't care how much money you got and how great you were in your field of, of endeavor. God is not impressed with that if that's not what he called you to do. He's going to want to know, what did you do with what I called you to do and the gifts I gave you? So, in all reality, that's all that matters, right? You know, getting quiet on me, that's all that matters. Turn to Genesis chapter 12. I'm going to read one more illustration. I don't have much more. I don't have much more. Y'all getting anything out of this? Oh, yeah. I pray you are. I pray, as, like I said, I know it's Mother's Day, but honestly, it's for all of us. The question is, are we influencing our kids in the right direction? Genesis chapter 12. We've got to be pushing them in the direction of God. We've got to be careful. And listen, I know I live in this world just like you do. It's so easy to get caught up with thinking, well, this is, this is what everybody's doing. Let's just do it. But you can tell my kids. I mean, my son sits back there right now. They just said something the other day. Matter of fact, it's about where we live. They said, man, Dad, everybody's riding back there. Everybody. And I said, well, I don't know who playing that is. I said, you ain't going to ride back there until I talk to you on that lane. I don't care what everybody else is doing. I said, you ain't doing it. Because they're mine. Right? So don't, don't fall for the truth. Well, everybody's doing it. Well, this is what everybody's doing. I remember when I was a young man. Turn to Genesis 12. That's where we're going. When I was a young man, it was the, the uh, I don't know what you would call it, but what everybody was going into when I graduated high school was an engineer. Everybody wanted to be an engineer. And then guess what happens? Well, what happened was there was a shortage of engineers. Engineers made good money. So everybody wanted to be a good engineer. Well, when everybody swamps that, 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 uh, that field, then you got too many engineers, and some of them can't work. And then it was nursing, and then it's, you know, then it's real estate. And I'm not against any of that. My wife's a real estate agent. I'm, I'm an engineer, but I don't have a degree. I can just engineer things. But, but I'm, that was a joke to make you laugh. But, but the point I'm making is don't just do something because that's what everybody else is doing. Don't just send your kid, like right now, it's IT, it's computer things. And of course, the natural mind says, hey, you didn't go to school for computers. No, what you really need to do is say, God, what do you want me to do? Amen. God, what do you want me to do? If God says go to school for computers, then guess what you do? You go to school for computers. And you say, Lord, what school do you want me to go to? That's really how this thing works. For those that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The greatest thing you'll teach your kids. I just told my son last night, I'm bringing you home the book by Brother Hayden, How to Be Led by the Spirit of God. That's going to be his summer reading, not some textbook from school, but he's going to learn about how to be led by the Spirit of God. Because I said, son, at 14 years old, if you learn how to follow this right here, oh, you got it made. Right? As a Christian, if you learn to follow your spirit, you got it made. Genesis chapter 1. We're going to read for just a second about Isaac and, and Abraham. <coughs> Genesis 12. I'm sorry if I said the wrong thing. Genesis 12. <coughs> I told you 12. That's wrong. It's Genesis 22. I apologize. Oh, mixed up. Genesis chapter 22. I'm just going to read 1 through 12 real quick. <coughs> Genesis 22, verse number 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. He said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. And offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I tell, will tell thee of. Now listen, before I go any further, God is not telling you to sacrifice your child if they're being bad. Do not try to play that game. Verse 3, just want to throw that out of there. Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clayed the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Abide here, abide you here with the donkey, and I, am, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again too. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. That's bad. You got to carry the wood. You get ready to get sacrificed over. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac, so Isaac start his senses start kicking in here. Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son. So now Isaac found the lamb. It was himself. It bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham, listen to how serious this thing got, guys. Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Now, do y'all remember how old Abraham was when he had Isaac? He was 100 years old when he had Isaac. He was longing for a son. Now, y'all remember he tried to work it out. Him and his wife tried to work, his wife tried to work it out, and, and they tried to do God's plan another way. Well, that wasn't the right way. 
Because Abraham said, you, or God said, Abraham, you and Sarah are going to have a son. You're going to name him Isaac. His name's Isaac because of, it means laughter. And they laughed when God said, you're going to have a son. But so he's taking this son. He waited all this time for him. Remember Hannah? Hannah waited all those years to have a child. She realized what a gift he was. But listen, Abraham, in verse 11, he's taking this knife. He's, he's got his son bound. He's got the knife drawn back. The angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, <coughs> Abraham. And he said, here I am. Verse 12 where I wanted to get. I got it all highlighted in my Bible. He said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. Listen to this. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. Y'all see what Abraham was willing to do. He was willing to give his sons a life if that was required. Waited a hundred years for this son. And I asked the question, just like I did in 1 Samuel. Will you lend your children to God? This question here. Will you give your kids to God or you withhold them? The angel said, now I see. You fear God. You've not withheld your only son. I want to encourage you this morning not to withhold your children. Because when we get our minds involved, we get in trouble. We start thinking, well, I don't, I don't if you're not careful. I don't, I, I, listen, I'm in ministry. I know it's not easy. I know what we deal with. We work all the time and then you hear people say, well, y'all just preach twice a week. And people don't think you do anything. That is so difficult to deal with. And we deal with all kinds of stuff. I saw my dad, you know, our whole life, we didn't have a lot of stuff. You know, we didn't have a lot of stuff in life. You know, coming up when we were little boys, we never knew we were poor, but we was poor. We didn't know it, though. Why? Because we had a house filled with love. We had so much fun at our house. We had all kinds of uh, good times. At our, I mean, I remember the things that we ate and stuff. I look back on it now and I go, man, we didn't have hardly nothing. But we had everything. You see what I'm saying? To the world, to other people, we didn't have nothing. To us boys, ask my brother, ask Pastor Jason when he gets back, ask James back here, ask me. We had everything. We had a loving home. We had a mom and dad. My mom stayed home with us. I'm not telling you what you need to do. That was what my parents decided to do. And because of that, there was sacrifice. There was sacrifice. But it was worth it to us. I remember I played baseball, and Pastor Jason did too. I mean, I was just a lot better. But anyway, <laughs> I said I was not here. But I was I played from when I was five till the day I graduated high school. I never missed a year. I played in all the all stars and all that stuff. I, I, my dad, the only time he missed was when he was preaching on Wednesday nights. Uh, and my mom never missed. And don't tell me that don't mean something. You know, everybody else might have had nicer cars and nicer things, but you know what? Their mom and dad, a lot of times, they were working while their kids were playing ball. They had people drop them off. And I, if you have to do that, please don't think I'm knocking you. I'm just telling you that, that, that I remember those things. And now I look back and go, I'm so thankful that my parents sacrificed. I, I, money don't mean nothing. It really doesn't. God will take care of you. There's so I, I want to leave you with this. There's so many things more important than finances. Amen. I know people Amen. think, well, I'm going to work all my life and leave my kids all this money. Can I tell you something? That's great. But there's something they'll appreciate more. And that's a legacy of faith. If you will leave them an example of how to be led by God's Spirit, an example of a person that says, we're not following God, <coughs> we're following Jesus. If you leave them the example of when it's time to go to church, we're going to church. If you leave that example of seeking God first in His kingdom, if you leave them that I give you my word, it'll mean more than any dollar you ever leave them. It'll mean more than any land you ever leave them. I promise you that. I promise you that it'll be everything. I've been with people when they die. A lot of people when they die. That's what they have is not on their mind. It's not. It's what did I do? Did I do everything I could do? And so I say that again to all of us. Are we going to lend our kids to God? Are we withholding them from God? Because we think we know what's best for them. I want to leave you with this. I, I've got to get to one more thing real quick. But we have to trust that God knows what's best for them. And I know sometimes, as I'm up here preaching, I, I got three kids, so I know that that day's coming for me. I know that. I know my kids might be called to do something, and it might not be right beside me. If every parent had their wish, they'd probably have a, a big piece of land their kids could all build up right next to them. And if you have that, you'll thank God for it every day if that's what God's called y'all to do. But I can tell you that that's not what God's called everybody to do. And, and your kids might be called. Like I said, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the future holds for all of my kids at the present time. I don't have to worry about it right now. But that day's going to come, and I'm going to tell you, I had a hard enough time moving from once born to marry. I cannot imagine letting my kids go, you know, to some other country and serve in the way God wants them to. But I can tell you this, Daddy won't never withhold them. 
I'll say, I love you, and I'm so proud of you. If that's what God's calling you to do, and I'll be, I'll be getting me some frequent flyer miles because I'll be coming to see you. But I'm so proud. Why? Because you're doing what God calls you to do. That's the greatest thing you can do. And I, we're still talking about a mother's influence. Our job is to influence them and compel them to follow God, not follow the world. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I want to read it to you out of the Message Bible. And I'm wrapping up. It, Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, So here's what I want you to do. Message Bible. God is helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Listen to this. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out, readily recognize what He wants from you, and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you, the greatest thing you'll ever do for your kids, mom or dad, is offer them to God to use how he sees fit and trust him that he knows best. That scripture we just read says, don't become so well adjusted to the world, we fit in without even thinking. What does that mean? Don't just do what everybody else is doing. It, it seems, and y'all know the old saying, keeping up with the Joneses, please don't fall into that trap. Don't try to keep up with the Joneses. You keep up with the word. You keep up with the Holy Spirit. You obey Him. 2 Corinthians just right there, <coughs> chapter 6, verse 17 says, Therefore come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. Guys, we have to remember as Christians, we're called to be different. Amen. We're called to be a light in a dark world. Yes, a amen. city set on a hill. Salt of the earth. And if you're called to be that, guess what your children are called to be? That. And so we're not supposed to raise them to go to school to fit in perfectly. We're supposed to raise them to go be a difference maker. We're supposed to raise them to follow God. Pastor Jason always says this, and I love it. He said, if you want to find out what to do in life, find out the direction everybody's going, and they go the opposite direction. And 99% of the time, that's just true. Because the world, listen, the world is looking for answers. If you're a believer, you got answers. You're not looking for them, you got them. He lives inside of you. He's all knowing spirit of God. Last thing I want, last point I have to hit is Ephesians 6, 1 and 2. This will apply to everybody. Because I know I'm talking about a mother's influence. And like I said, the greatest thing you'll ever do is influence them to follow God. But the question I want to ask in closing, how should we treat our moms? This is for everyone. And I want to I have to say the scripture before we leave. Ephesians chapter 6, 1 and 2. It says, Children, obey your parents because you, I'm reading the New Living Translation. Obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor <clears throat> your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. And he goes on to say that you're, you'll live a long life. Brother Hayden always said it, and I agree. If you don't honor your mom and dad, it'll shorten your life. The word honor means to prize, fix a value upon, revere or value. The benefit for you obeying this is long life. I think about Isaac. Remember we just read about Isaac? You talk about someone who honored their parents. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, my dad was a big, strong guy. He, he was a big, I mean, if you knew him, he was a big old strong guy, and I was very small. I mean, I've gotten a lot bigger in a bad way, but I've gotten a lot bigger than I was. But when, when I was living at home, I was, I was not much of a match for my father. Not that I would have ever tried, but I can, I'm thinking to myself about honor. I think about it, and I think if my dad had started saying, Jeremy, the Lord wants me to sacrifice you. And, and I, I, he probably would have had a little fight on his hands. I cannot see myself just say, okay, dad, go ahead. That's what the Lord wants you to do. But I think about Isaac, and I know it was different times back then, but I think, man, what a, what a, what a dude that honored his, his parents. He was willing to say, hey, okay, if this is what we're supposed to do, this is what we're supposed to do. But I want to say this, like I said in closing. Maybe you're sitting here today and you say, my mom, you don't know what my mom's done to me. You don't know what my family's done to me. And I don't. I do not. So if you're in that situation, you know, I look at my life and, and I know I'm very blessed. I'm very fortunate. I had a great upbringing. But I understand everybody didn't. But I also understand this. The Word of God is for everybody. And so maybe you're in thing and say, I don't, I'm not going to honor my mother. I want to tell you something. You, you need to. Yes, not because they deserve it, but because the Word tells you to. Yeah. You, you don't honor them out of how great they are. You honor them out of how great God is. And that's what God told us to do. So I want to encourage you to forgive. 
Before we leave today, I want to encourage you to forgive. Search your heart. And if your mother's hurt you, now. I don't ever encourage anybody to go back into a hurtful situation and keep getting hurt. So if your family has decided not to change and they always hurt you, then you don't have to be around them, but you do have to forgive them. You have to forgive them and you have to honor them. The word says, and you can write it down, the last scripture I'll give you, Mark 11, 25 and 26, that if you have anything against anyone, forgive them. Mm -hmm. That your Father in heaven may forgive you your trespasses, for if you do not forgive, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. So no matter what they've done, no matter how wrong they were, you still have a responsibility to say, I, and it's hard. <coughs> I know it's going to be hard. But listen, I've got people that hate us. We've got people, believe it or not, I know you look at us and think y'all are so wonderful. I people hate y'all, but um, that was a joke to get you to laugh. But we do have some people that absolutely <coughs> cannot stand us. And I'm telling you the truth when I tell you today, I love them. I mean that with all my heart. And I, it, it took me a little while to get there. I didn't have to tell you that. But I love them. I've chosen to forgive them. I'm not mad at them, and I pray for them almost every day of my life. But I mean that. I, why? Because of, because of how great? No, because of how great God is. Because I'm going to do what God told me to do. So I want to leave you with the fact that we as children and everybody in here is a child. To some of We have a responsibility to honor our father and mother. So in conclusion, mothers and fathers, but mothers, you have a great influence, right? Right? Are we going to influence our kids to follow God's plan or the world's plan? God's plan. And maybe you say, well, listen, I'm already past the, the childbearing years. I'm already, I'm already done raising kids. Listen, it's all right. You can't fix what's, you can't change nothing that's behind you. But what you can begin to do is influence your kids. Even, you know, if you've got adult children, they'll listen to you if you'll talk to them. But also, help your grandchildren. Raise, help raise your grandchildren in the right direction. Amen. Y'all go ahead and stand to your feet.